Welcome to our webinar. Today is Orbit Baby product update. And then also we have behind the recommendations and the cleaning recommendations. And as always, today's webinar is brought to you by State Farm and Safe Kids. So our objectives for today, first we're gonna learn about Orbit and toddler seats, learn about what car seats are made of and the properties of the material, about the flammability testing of fabrics and strength testing of the webbing, and also discuss various acceptable cleaning options. So we have two great speakers on with us today. First of all, we have Jonathan Otero. He serves as a compliance and safety expert and child passenger safety technician instructor. He brings a passion for injury prevention to Orbit Baby. And during his time as a technician, he strived to create stronger bonds between the community and manufacturers, as well as improving outreach to the immigrant communities. Jonathan started his career in CPS in Florida over 19 years ago. And since then, he's worked with programs and manufacturers across the country, working to bring new ideas to the industry. And we're really happy to have Jonathan on the call today. And we also have with us today, Vera Fullaway. And Vera's undergraduate studies were completed at Colorado State University with majors in physics and microbiology. And her current position at Safe Traffic System is regulatory compliance officer and customer service manager. And even though her bio looks short today, there is so much more to Vera that we all know and we're just thrilled to have her on the call with us today as well. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Jonathan. All right, thank you. And I will second what you just said. Vera's bio is too short for all of the stuff she has accomplished. Um, she's being very humble when she sent that over, I think. Anyway, so I'm Jonathan, I'm from Orbit Baby. And some of you may have seen this if I've traveled to your region for this presentation, but I still like to do this presentation because we're still a very new company to a lot of people out there, uh, we really want to get that exposure. We want to make sure you understand our products, that you know we exist, and that you're not kind of like sidelined by some new strange car seat that shows up at your fitting station, inspection station, or virtual check. So you're kind of like, oh, yes, I've heard of this one. I know about it. Let's go. And what makes Orbit unique is our smart hub technology. We have this smart hub that allows the car seat, the stroller seat, everything to rotate 360 degrees and to dock into the base or onto the stroller at any angle. So I kind of get into that, but that is our kind of unique product spin. So if you've heard of us or seen of us, you're familiar with this. If not, I'm here to show you. Now we were in the market a long time ago. Uh, I think it was 2008 up until, I forget what year. Uh, and we had legacy products or what we call legacy products. These are our G1s, our G2 and our G3 line of products. If somebody comes to your fitting station and they have a G1, a G2, or a G3 car seat, stop right there. Say, hey, this thing's expired. I already know because they don't make G3s anymore. The new ones look similar, but the G3s, G2s, and G1s are still out there. We get a lot of people reaching out to us looking for replacement parts, new upholstery, because they are a little more expensive of a car seat. So people hold on to them longer. And they try to pass them down. Uh, to either grandkids, other kids, or whatever. So make sure you're stopping people when you see these older sheets and say, hey, you know, it's expired. We do have a program for them. Um, I'll get into that if they want to stay in the Orbit family. But today I'm really going to talk about our G5 product line. Uh, we have two seats, which are the infant seat and the toddler seat. And I'm going to start off with the infant seat today. The infant seat There we go, is rear facing only. Uh, it comes in a merino wool, so that has no flame retardants or anything. And we have our upgrade discount. That is a discount for people coming from older products. They still have the stroller and they still have the whole system that they want to stay with, but they want or need a new car seat. We offer 20% off for them so they can kind of get into a, a new orbit car seat for a little less money and keep everything else. And we do have replacement parts and we do offer a two year warranty on our products. So if somebody has something that's broken or not working right, um, because God knows what happened to the car seat, tell them to reach out to us. We have a fantastic customer service and we do offer a two year warranty. 
The, as I mentioned, the infant seat, it's rear facing only four to 30 pounds, 19 to 32 inches, and it must be used on the base. So I'll get to one in instance where you don't use the base, but for every vehicle ride, you have to use the base or that smart hub base. Um, so if you hear smart hub, that's kind of referring to that base. Now the seat comes with a newborn insert. This newborn insert is slightly different in that it's installed underneath the upholstery and it's used for little kids. Uh, it's not required, it's optional. It comes in the box, but you have to put it in yourself if you choose to use it. Some people toss this out because it looks like a piece of packaging. We try to encourage them not to do that. Uh, we've started putting our logo on it and trying to encourage people to, hey, look, this is something important. Uh, and now we find that people are really putting it in their car seat because they see that it's called newborn inserts. They stick it in there and they never take it out. So if you have a child that comes to your fitting station or, or you're talking to a parent, they're like, you know, the harness just doesn't fit anymore. I don't understand why. It's probably because the child is now 15, 16, however much the child weighs, and they're still using this insert underneath the upholstery and it needs to come out. It should have come out at 11 pounds. Some kids are a little bit bigger lengthwise and they actually need to have it taken out sooner. So just make sure that if a parent's complaining about the harness, this is the first thing you kind of jump in and look for. It's underneath the upholstery. And I'm gonna show you here how it goes. The insert goes underneath the, the upholstery. It contours to the shell of the seat. And then you pull the upholstery back over that insert so you don't see it. Uh, and with new parents, you know, they have that baby brain fog. They forget it's down there and they just suddenly can't understand why the seat seems so small for their kid that's getting so big. Uh, so just check down there. I also mentioned an instance where you won't use the base. So if you're traveling on an airplane, you don't use the base. They can check the base, you know, with their carry-on bags. Uh, you'll use the base or the seat without the base on the airplane. And that's the only situation where you're going to do that. Also, no inflatable seat belts. This goes for vehicles and airplanes. There are some airplanes with inflatable seat belts. Uh, just make sure that the parent knows that no inflatable seat belts if they get a bulkhead row or something like that on an airplane. All right, as I mentioned, we have our, our strong arm base with our smart hub. The smart hub is that round silver piece, and then the strong arm is that silver knob down at the front. Uh, the base is designed so that the seat can dock into the uh, the seat can dock onto the base at any angle and then be rotated to go rear facing. The strong arm knob amplifies the parent's strength so that they don't have to really push and pull on a seat belt. They buckle it in, they'll uh, close the lock off, and they're just going to turn that knob. And you can see that the base upright then moves, and that's going to cinch down on the seat belt for the parent. So this is really great for parents with arthritis or bad shoulders. They can't push and pull or just don't quite understand they have to push and pull. So they put the seatbelt through there, they lock off that lock off, and they just turn that knob. We tell parents, turn it about five times and then test it. We're going to test at the belt guides. If it's nice and snug, we're good. If it's not, give it another few more turns. You don't need to crank it all the way out. Uh, we're just doing it till the base is nice and snug. Um, so here's kind of an example of it working. So that lock off is a true lock off. Uh, you'll pass a seat belt through there. The latch belt does not go there. That latch belt actually runs behind the lock off. So you won't have to worry about that. And then you're just going to turn that knob and test the seat and make sure that it's in nice and tight. Another unique thing is we do allow non-standard spacing. Uh, non-standard spacing for those center latch positions that a vehicle manufacturer allows, we also allow up to 20 inches of non-standard spacing. So you'll have to check with the vehicle manufacturer. As long as they allow it, we're good with that. Um, as you can see here, this seat has that weird plastic piece. So that could interfere. So you, you might have to go to the seatbelt anyway, uh, but we do allow non-standard spacing if the vehicle manufacturer allows it. Additionally, we have a, a kind of a long base because we need that seat to rotate on the base, so it's kind of a little bit of a longer base. So we do allow a little bit of overhang. We follow that 80-20 <clears throat> rule. So as long as 80% of the base is over the vehicle seat, and I say over the vehicle seat because depending on the contour of the seat, especially in some cars, they have more of a dip where the base might not make perfect contact with the entire cushion, 
But as long as 80% of it is over the vehicle seat, we're okay. So another change we made um, is we updated the head support. This headrest or head support went from the one on the left, which is kind of that U-shaped, to the one on the right, which is a side pillow design. It's completely optional. If a parent shows up with one or the other, it's okay. Depending on when they purchase the car seat, the G5, it has one of the other head supports. Both of them come with the seat. You could actually interchange them if you have both. Some parents went out and you know, contacted customer support and actually got that side pillow one because it worked better for their kids. Uh, so if a parent shows up with it, great. If they don't have it because they took it off, it's completely optional. That head support is really just for support of the child, not necessary. Um, just know that we do have two styles that might come with a car seat. So you can see two G5s with completely different head supports. Another unique feature of the Orbit car seat is our soft carry handle. It's not a hard piece of plastic and it doesn't automatically lock up in the upright position. So when a parent is working with the seat, we wanna make sure that they lock this handle in the upright position so that there's no tip over if they're carrying the child. To lock it, we just pass that Velcro piece through the red ring and it locks it in the upright position. To open it, we just lift the Velcro, it pushes right down. So we wanna make sure that we kind of talk to parents, you know, when we're in and around cars or outside of the car, that they're still using the seat properly and that there's no risk for tip over. Now we get into our toddler car seat. So we call this our toddler car seat and not just a convertible car seat, because if you look at the weight limit of where it starts, it starts at 15 pounds. We don't want a brand new newborn in the seat. We want them in our infant seat. This is more for a child that has good head control. They can sit upright, their head doesn't flop forward, doesn't fall to the side. They can sit upright without any assistance. Then they can move to this car seat. It can be rear facing or forward facing, and it's the next step in their journey with the car seats. So from infant seat, we move to this toddler seat. The toddler seat um, can be used with the base or without the base. So if the parent is rear facing, all they have to do is take that same base, they take the infant seat off and they click this right on there. You'll see the little gray handles there. That allows the seat to click onto the base <coughs> and rotate. So they can turn the seat sideways to face the door, harness in the child, get them all in, and then rotate it into that rear locked position. Alternatively, if they're traveling or they don't wanna have the base or they didn't buy a second base, the seat comes with these side impact braces. Those braces must be used if you're not using the base. I have a little video here. The side impact braces are directional and color coded. So when they're attaching it to the side of the seat, we wanna make sure that the colors line up to the direction we're facing the car seat. So blue is rear facing, red is forward facing. So in this video, you can see red first, that would be the forward facing setup. And then we, if we wanna reverse it, we take that brace off, we put it on the other side, and then we'll have a rear facing setup. So make sure that you're either using the base or the side impact braces and that they're set up correctly. If you do it wrong, you're gonna have a really upright seat for rear facing or a reclined seat for forward facing, which we don't want. Now we do have a little bit different installation. We have two lock offs for rear facing. As you can see, they're color coded and they're recessed a little bit into the shell. So when you're using the lock off, we only wanna use the one closest to either the center of the vehicle or to the buckle. We're only using one of them rear facing. We're gonna buckle the seat in, take some of the slack out. We're not gonna really tighten it down too much because these recessed lock offs will actually take out that last little bit of slack out of the webbing to give you a nice snug installation. There are two doors, so make sure you lift the blue and the black one, pass the seatbelt through, and then lock. You don't need to switch the retractor, only use the lock off. Board facing is a little different. As you see here, <clears throat> we have a red lock offs. So for forward facing, everything is red. We tried to color code everything as much as we could to make it easier for parents. Um, when you're using the lock offs, in this case, same situation, let's say the, the buckle is on the right, both the lap belt and the shoulder belt are gonna go through the lock off on the right 
only the lap belt goes to the buckle or through the lock off on the left. So it's a little tricky to remember. Um, we do have videos on this. It's in the manual. We try to make it as easy for you to access the information. But if you're doing forward facing, just know that only one lock off gets both. And that's the one that's closest to the buckle or the center of the vehicle. As I mentioned, we try to make it easy for parents to access all of this information. So this QR code is available on both the toddler seat and the infant seat. They scan that QR code and immediately takes them to, the, there's a PDF version of the manual because parents lose their manuals all the time and also how to videos. So the videos are actually broken up into about one minute segments. So if parent just needs to see harnessing or how to adjust the harness or forward facing or rear facing or latch installation, there's all these different videos and they just click on the one that pertains to what they're trying to do. They don't need to watch a long video. It's about a one minute video that quickly describes and shows how to install that car seat or harness the car seat. Additionally, there's some information for customer support. Uh, so they can reach out to us and say, hey, still don't understand what's going on. Our customer support is awesome. You could do a video call, you can phone, you can email, you can text message, you can WhatsApp, you can Facebook message, you can Instagram message. I'm trying to think of all the other ways. So they try to make it as easy as possible. You can see even if you go on our website, there's a little camera down there. They can click on that. They don't have to turn on their camera, but there's a customer support person that will be able to help them. And basically whatever channel they wanna use, we're there to help them. We try to make this as easy as possible for the parents. Next slide, all right. The toddler seat, as we mentioned, comes off that base and it goes onto the stroller. So when it's being used as a stroller seat, which you can do, especially if you're traveling, you don't wanna take a stroller seat and everything else, you just want a car seat and a stroller. You can put it on the stroller base and it comes with the sun canopy. The sun canopy is included with the toddler seat when the parent purchases it, and it is used for the stroller. We wanna make sure the parent's not using it in the vehicle because it does create a bit of a blind spot. And we don't want blind spots because we know what that leads to. So if you have a parent that's using it in the car, just let them know, hey, pop this off when you're in the car. You can put it on when you're in the stroller. Now, questions we get all the time. When does my car seat expire? Well, we give you seven years and it's to the last day of the year. So if you notice on the slide, it just says 2026 is when this base and seat expire. Well, it's good all the way up to December 31st of 2026. We give you the full year. Uh, you don't have to worry about, oh, this one says June 15th, doesn't matter. You have the whole 2026 till it expires. Now, as I mentioned, we're trying to get this product out there so people can see it. We also want you to interact with this seat. So we do have, in rare occasions, sometimes seats available for training programs. It has to be for a training program, so you have to be an instructor. I will need a letter of donation or proof that it's going to an organization, not to a person. Um, and these are seats that usually we get them as returns and they're in fantastic condition because we have an, a great return policy when parents buy directly from our website. I think they have 60 days to look at the seat, experiment with it, see if they like it. Sometimes parents decide, nope, not for me, or just, whoa, that was way too expensive. Never mind, I actually need to go a little lower. Um, so we get these seats back that are in great condition, but we can't resell them. We can't resell a seat that we don't know what's happened to it. So we try to make them available for training programs. So reach out to me. Um, if you have a training program that can use one of these in your kit, just know that it's based on availability. Sometimes we don't have any returns in stock. Um, sometimes I have a couple. So just as they kind of become available, I try to send them out. I'll put you on a list, but reach out if you have a training program that is actively doing car seat trainings, certification courses. And lastly, this is my contact information. As I mentioned, uh, Instagram, that is my Instagram that goes directly to my work phone. So if that's easier for you to send pictures on there or whatever, you can message me at orvicbaby underscore support or you can reach out to my email right there. If you need customer service, that is also their phone number. Great, and that is it for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Vera. Hello, everyone. First, we're gonna talk about the plastic. So we're gonna talk about car seats, not just ride safe or travel vests. I'm gonna talk a little bit about everything. So, um, 
there are seven main types of plastics. With those seven main types of plastics, the majority of car seats are made of polypropylene. Polypropylene has some really interesting qualities. The chemical property, or it has a very high chemical resistance. And it's generally noted as having a high resistance to chemicals compared to polyethylene, which is the regular plastic. So with the seven different types of plastic, I'll actually tell you what they're mostly used for. Polypropylene has a very high tensile strength and compared to many materials, polypropylene structure has a, has a tensile strength somewhere around 4,800 PSI, that's pounds per square inch, which makes it a really wonderful lightweight thing to make car seats out of or but something that's highly resistant to put around substructure, metal substructures on car seats. It has a high impact and a high or a high impact tolerance. And propylene is highly impermeable to water. So, and it has a surface hardness. Maximum recommended operating temperature for polypropylene is 180 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's not going to melt. And this is very important for us when we're talking about car seats, because obviously car seats get very hot in the car. The melting temperature is at 327 degrees Fahrenheit, so you don't need to worry about the um, car seat cracking if it's been left in a hot car or if it's been in a really cold room. I just wanted to assure you that all car seats or most car seats are tested in what are known as environmental chambers. There are a lot of different types of environmental chambers, but the ones that are used for um, car seats can include temperature chambers like the climatic testing chamber, which the temperatures vary between negative 70 degrees Celsius and over 180 degrees Celsius, which works out to negative 94 Fahrenheit and 356 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think that any car is going to get above 356 degrees Fahrenheit, so there's no need to worry about the plastics there. This can be tested in humidity chambers, vibration chambers, stability chambers, salt spray chambers, thermal shock chambers. Um, vacuum chambers, altitude chambers. I don't think anybody does altitude, but it's out there if anybody wants to. And anechoic chambers are the last of the group of chambers that are available. And that's just to prevent echoes in some environments. But I, I don't think that that's the case in car seats. Although having screaming kids in the back seat sometimes makes me wonder if that wouldn't be such a good idea. Um, the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard that we need to pass for flammability plays a huge role in what types of materials that we use on the fabrics, on, on the types of fabrics. That flammability standard is standard number 302 with the scope of it being that it specifies the burn resistance requirement of materials used in occupant compartments motor vehicles. It was written a very long time ago and there is some talk that this may change at some point in the future, but I haven't heard any buzz about when it's going to change. So a short little video about how it is done. The flammability testing uses that flammability chamber with a piece of fabric. The piece of fabric has to be a certain length and it has to be a certain thickness, and then it is put inside of this flammability chamber. This chamber is sometimes called the Bunsen burner test. And then the whole thing is turned on. A flame is lit, and then the fabric is slid toward the flame. And then if the fabric doesn't burn more, in a, more than a certain amount of distance in a certain amount of time that it passes the flammability requirement. Obviously, this is all very important to us to be able to be compliant with federal motor vehicle safety standards, but then this also comes into play in a huge way with being able to clean some of those fabrics, and that's what today's um, talk is all about.
So one of the questions that comes up is, are car seats being sprayed with chemicals? The answer is most of the time, no. I can't speak for absolutely everybody, but as far as I understand from my friends in the industry, almost everybody, including vehicle manufacturers, are using uh, threads that are coated in some type of a, some type of a flame retardant uh, compound. It's not necessarily a chemical. Some some car seat manufacturers use natural fire retardant things like wool. So, but wool is very, very expensive, so not everybody uses it. But is your life completely chemical free? Well, no, because the same standard or a very similar standard that we have to meet with Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 302 is has to be met inside of your house. So your insulation, your upholstery, the, your carpet, your carpet padding, some baby products, a lot of that actually has to meet a flammability standard also. So then we come to cleaning of car seats and cleaning of car seats. It's very interesting to me because often I get I get questions very often about cleaning, not just the right safe for travel vests and, and our Travel Smarter Booster, but I, as an instructor, I get questions about how to clean car seats by parents when I'm doing car seat installations or assistance with um, any type of a child passenger safety question that I get over the phone or on video. And and a lot of the a lot of the things that I'm going to cover in this last section come from the questions that I have had and the experiences I've had with parents and what they've used to clean car seats with. And a tremendous amount of it comes from YouTube because it, when I was put creating this presentation, what I did was I looked on YouTube to see how people are cleaning vehicles and their car seats. So a lot of the things that you're gonna see here, I didn't make up. This is not, this is not just a Vera thing. This is actually happening out there. So I found a solvent compatibility chart because some of the things that I've had people tell me that they want to clean their car seats with and their right safe for travel vests with, which you're looking at the top there with, with the acronyms, that is the type of plastic. Those are the seven main types of plastic that are used. So ABS plastic, low density polyethylene, uh, polycarbonate plastic, poly... Um, pentene plastic, polypropylene, polystyrene, and uh, the last one is PTFE, which is a uh, pentafluoroethylene, and that has th that's used mainly in like plane bearings, gears, side plates, and seals and gaskets and whatnot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave all of the plastics that could be found on a car seat up on the screen here and cover up the ones that are not, and then. In the first column, you see solvents. So a lot of these solvents we have absolute access to. So um, I want you to look at the polypropylene column. Everything that is green means that you could probably clean with it and be safe cleaning with it, provided that it's a purely polypropylene shell. But if you look at the first column, which is ABS, some car seats do contain ABS plastic components on them. And that solvent still works well. But when you look at uh, the last one, which is polystyrene, polystyrene is the foamy stuff that's on the inside of the car seat that absorbs the energies of the crash force. Now, as you keep looking down the polypropylene, you'll notice that there are some, for example, methyl alcohol. If you go take the poly, look at the polypropylene, methyl alcohol can be used on the outer shell, but when we're looking at the ABS, it is not a very good thing for the ABS. It is actually has a huge effect on that. So that could actually be a functional component that needs to stay intact. So these are some of the things that are taken into account when our engineers and our teams decide what it is that you can use on the, the component, whether it's in the vehicle or in the uh, car seat. Also, we have 
we have webbing that has to be able to contain that child. And with being able to contain the child in the car seat, it has to have a certain amount of stretch to it. And at the same time, it has to, the same webbing has to have a certain amount of strength to it to be able to protect the child in the way that it is intended to, pr to protect. So uh, several years ago, I know that IMMI, who is a, one of the manufacturers of webbing, did some testing with soil webbing and they found that even simple things like apple juice and milk and coca-cola things like that really affected not the not necessarily the strength but the stretchiness of that webbing so that that alone could um could change the way that the car seat performs Cleaning of fat, uh, there's Manufacturers Alliance for Child Passenger Safety has a harmonized statement about washing car seat fabrics and harnesses. It is absolutely crucial to read the car seat instructions for cleaning fabrics and other components. But I'm going to add one more thing here. During the COVID times, a lot of the manufacturers did additional studies on what their car seats and a child restraint systems could be cleaned with and the processes that they could be cleaned with which are not going to be found in the instruction manuals most of the time because it's just too wordy and there's just too many variables so trying to keep those instruction manuals at uh, at a reasonable length we tend to not put absolutely everything in it so what i would recommend is that in, instead of having to hold for customer service in some cases, you can just go on the manufacturer's website, find the frequently asked questions. And a lot of times in the frequently asked questions, you're gonna see enhanced recommendations for being able to clean. On the Safe Traffic System website, which is rightsafer.net, you're gonna actually be able to see a huge amount of do's and don'ts because I popped in there absolutely everything that people were asking me during COVID if they could use to clean their right safer travel best. And I said, absolutely not. So I popped that up on the website for us. Uh, there are various processes for cleaning harnesses. I'm gonna include some of the car seat manufacturers here, just so you can see these are screenshots out of their instruction manuals, out of their user guides. So this is an example of the Durrell Juvenile Safety First Grow and Go and it tells you that you can machine wash the pieces separately with cold water or gentle cycle. This is an example of the flow car seat from CLEC and they recommend only spot cleaning. They actually have a compound that they can sell to the users of CLEC car seats for their unique fabrics that are being used. We have an example from up a baby, up a baby um, recommends spot cleaning, air drying, to not use bleach, water, or iron. Now, please remember that excessive heat from any kind of an iron is going to change the chemical properties and the physical properties of everything on a car seat. So irons, irons and that includes curling irons. So no curling irons on that harness. An example out of Orbit Baby G5 car seat, and you can see here that there is an extensive write-up of what it is that you need to use, what you can use and what you can't use on cleaning, not just the car seat fabrics, but also the restraint harnesses, the car seat uh, smart hub. So it has a lot of information. Typically these recommendations are toward the back of the instruction manual. We have care and cleaning of the vest, which it says in our instruction manual, this is for the right safer travel vest, it says do not machine wash. But we have recently changed our recommendation that we permit machine washing, but we made the decision not to put it in our instruction manual because I would much rather be able to write out that the 
vest needs to be put into a laundry bag, otherwise it's going to beat up the inside of your washing machine, and we're most certainly not going to be replacing anybody's wash machine. So we just made the decision to put do not wash on it. Now, example of uh, the frequently asked questions, this is a screenshot from the RideSafer.net website. And then when you click on FAQs, you're going to find an entire FAQ with very, uh, very detailed instructions on what you cannot use and what you can use. There are various steps depending on what the problem is. Uh, if it is COVID related or if it's a virus, then you, you can spray it down with a little bit of alcohol or, or um, or hydrogen peroxide, if it's something like a problem with lice, then it's going to be a completely different type of a situation. If it's a problem with molds or mildews, it's going to be a completely different cleaning. So when we're talking about cleaning, it's not just the car seat. I want to talk just a little bit about the webbing in the vehicle, because one of the things that I've noticed during the pandemic is that Rental car companies were routinely cleaning with chemicals, with like gaseous chemicals on the inside of the car. So I called up some of the vehicle manufacturers. I said, are you aware that they're doing this? And everybody freaked out. So I said, well, okay, so how does that affect your webbing inside of the vehicle? So no one has a really clear cut answer for me. So I decided that I was gonna talk about some practices that are permitted. Okay, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 209 covers uh, harness or covers webbing inside of the vehicle. So the purpose and the scope of the FMVSS 209 is to specify the requirements for seat belt assemblies inside of the vehicle. So all seat belts have to have a certain amount of stretch, they have to have a certain amount of strength, and they have to be able to withstand uh, certain amount of um, the various various daily activities and still be able to retain their ability to restrain a person correctly as intended when the car was built. FMVSS 209 actually defines the hardware that we learn about in child passenger safety class. If you're interested in what the actual definitions are, that's what you're going to see, but it's very, very close to what we use in child passenger safety. Actually, it's the same thing, depending on how it's worded by the instructor. One of the requirements for um, the webbing is that the webbing is not less than 46 millimeters. So that's 1.81 inches. That's pretty standard. Most of our webbing in the car is is five panel or seven panel webbing, which means it has a very specific weave, but the weave is in vertical panels and those panels are the, are the ones that usually get stuffed with whatever it is, the, the dirt and the, and the food and the drinks and whatnot, but they have to have a certain amount of breaking strength. So it's very important that we not clean that with any kind of a compound that is going to be able to um, make that polyester a little bit weaker or we actually don't want it to be any stronger either because it has to have a certain type of a, a certain breaking strength then it has to have stretch in it now the video here is actually a much quicker video than you're going to be able to see just because of the feed of the internet here but this is how webbing is tested the, the webbing for motor vehicles and webbing for car seats is tested in ex exactly the same way this is not vehicles um, the webbing that's being shown here just because this is a faster video than before. So what you see is that machine pulling up on the webbing and it's going to continue to pull. And if you look on the screen of the machine, you're gonna notice that it has kilonewtons. The KN stands for kilonewtons. Newtons is a measurement of force. So as it's the millimeters are getting bigger, the kilonewtons are getting bigger and it's going to continue to measure until that webbing breaks. So when we're treating webbing with anything that is going to alter 
the stretch and alter the strength of that, we are actually, in some cases, making the situation not very safe for whoever is going to be using that piece of webbing as a seat belt. Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 209 also specifies the webbing elongation, which is that stretchiness that I was talking about. The stretchiness is actually broken up between the shoulder portion and the lap portion of the seat belt. The lap portion of the seat belt has to stretch only up to about 20%. The, in a type two seat belt system, which is the lap and shoulder seat belt, the lap portion can stretch up to 30%, but the torso portion has to stretch up to 40%, which is one of the reasons why the seat belts are created the way they are with the types of latch plates that they have, whether it is a sliding dynamic sewn on latch plate, whatever kind of latch plate you have, this is all taken into account. Webbing is also tested for abrasion for light and for microorganisms, and it has to be resistant to a certain amount of abrasion light in organisms. So those people that understand how UV rays work in degrading the strength of this type of polyester webbing for when it's being used outdoors, please be assured and trust in the materials that light and UV light microorganisms, all of this is taken into account when the webbing is being made and being purchased. Some of the things I found on YouTube for cleaning webbing were absolutely frightening to me because they are using compounds that are um, that can be very, very um, dangerous to use on these types of, of um, materials. The one that I found that was being used most often is vinegar. So vinegar cuts the soap buildup and it does, it does kill some bacteria, mostly food borne bacteria, but it's not going to be, it's not going to affect the webbing of the of the car very well if it's not soaked. So there are processes for soaking, but I'm going to say that vinegar, it, it, regular vinegar is 5% acetic acid. And as long as it is not more than 5% acetic acid, you need to contact the vehicle manufacturer. Every vehicle manufacturer that I've contacted said, no, absolutely not. Only use mild soap and uh, mild water. So I'm going to say absolutely not because you don't want to use the, the, because polyester is resistant, but it weakens the fabric and the rayon and the acetate silk, triacetate. So whatever else is being used in the car seat, please absolutely do not use it. And the vehicle manufacturers have said the same thing, not because it, they said that it would weaken the seat belt, but they said that they have not really done enough testing. A lot of the a lot of the technicians that I speak, that I talk to say that they use some kind of a citrus oil to clean um, their car seat harnesses and their vehicle seat belt systems with. Citrus oils are citric acid and the way that they work is they break down the fatty cells around the virus and around the bacterium, but it doesn't work on absolutely everything. But then you're coating everything in this oil and then you're gonna eventually need to get the oils to come out and that oil doesn't go away all by itself. Um, in motor vehicles, believe it or not, there is cleaning and maintenance instructions in the owner's manual. So it's very important that you follow these. And I wanted to show you a couple of them because they're very interesting. So this is a Toyota RAV4. It says, do not use polish wax or polish cleaner. The instrument panel may reflect off the windshield, obstructing the driver's view. There are some other recommendations as well. In the Volkswagen Tiguan, you have cleaning agent, you have a recommendation that cleaning agents and solvents cause the surface of the airbag modules to become porous and in an accident that triggers the airbag. Loose plastics 
parts can cause serious injury, never clean the dash panel and covers with cleaners that contain solvents. So solvents are absolutely, it, they can be absolutely anything that was on that solvent list that I showed you a few minutes ago. With the seat belts, it says carefully pull out the seat belt, right out and leave out, remove the large particles of dirt with a soft brush, clean the seat belt with a mild soap solution and leave this belt fabric to dry completely, then allow it to roll up. That means you're gonna to need to clamp it in some sort of way. Failure to clean parts properly can cause damage to the seat belts, the fastenings and the belt retractor. And then it goes on to tell you what you can and you cannot do by yourself and, and what to avoid and what to never repair or modify or remove seat belts by yourself. So these are some very stern warnings. The Honda Odyssey also has warnings and the Honda Odyssey will tell you to inspect the seat belts regularly and it's, it recommends using a soft brush with a mixture of mild soap and warm water to clean the seat belts to be able to get most of the soil out. Honda's, Hyundai Santa Fe cleaning the seat belt webbing has specific recommendations to follow the instructions provided with the soap. Do not bleach or re-dye the webbing because this may weaken the seat belt. We have a couple of questions and actually if others have questions, um, especially for Vera, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, while we're waiting for any other ones. Jonathan, there was a question that Lainey asked um, that there still is a substantial gap between the crotch area and the buckle, even when the infant insert in. In the past, um, you've not allowed a crotch roll to fill that. Has that been revisited at all? No, it hasn't. We still don't allow a crotch roll. Okay. All right, great. And then the other question, and you did talk about it, but I'm just going to have you one more time, the expiration period for yep. the so seats, if you can seven tell years, us about that. Seven years to the end of that year. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And Jonathan and Vera, it was great. You are much appreciated. Have a great and safe day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.